Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good afternoon dear students. Uh, in the last class we learnt about the cellular events that happen in inflammation, the sequential steps that happen before a leukocyte arrives at the site of inflammation we learnt were margination, rolling, addition, transmigration, chemotaxis and finally phagocytosis. We learnt that the leukocytes arrive at the site of inflammation and then they actually engulf the bacteria or any injurious agent and kill them. So, we learn a bit more in detail about this process of phagocytosis. So, this is what we learnt in the last class, the steps were margination, rolling, addition, transmigration and chemotaxis. And we also learnt about the various addition molecules that are involved in this process. Now, what you can see here is the leukocytes, the red cylinders that are seen here are the bacteria. The leukocytes cannot identify or recognize them unless the bacteria are coated by certain substances called as opsonins. So, the opsonins are usually immunoglobulins and the complements. Now, the leukocytes are able to recognize the bacteria. So, this process is called as recognition or opsonization. Now, once this opsonization of the bacteria happens, the leukocytes express receptors which bind to this opsonized bacteria. Now, once this attachment happens, the leukocytes extend their pseudopodia and internalize this bacteria inside their cells and form a vacuole contain the bacteria what is called as phagosome. So, you can see here engulfment happening following which there is a phagosome formation. Once the phagosome has formed, the lysosomes are uniting with the phagosomes and resulting in formation of a phagolysosome. Now, this phagolysosome, the lysosomes release their powerful bacteroidic enzymes into this vacuole causing degradation. In addition, there is other mechanism of killing which we will learn in the subsequent slide resulting in degradation or killing of the bacteria. So, the steps involved in phagocytosis include recognition, attachment, engulfment, phagolysosome formation and killing and degradation. So, the actual process of intracellular killing can be broadly classified into oxygen dependent which is a very powerful mechanism of killing the bacteria and oxygen independent. Now, let us look at oxygen dependent killing. Now, we learned, we saw that the bacteria are taken up inside the phagolysosomes which are intracellular vacuoles which are formed by the fusion of phagosome and lysosomes. Now, when this phagolysosome formation is happening, there is a sudden burst, respiratory burst, increased consumption of oxygen within the phagolysosome. This occurs with the help of the enzyme NADP oxidase. Now, the oxygen which is taken up within this phagolysosome is converted to superoxide. Now, this is a very potent oxygen radical. Now, this superoxide is further converted to hydrogen peroxide by an enzyme called as superoxide dismutase. Now, this hydrogen peroxide that is formed further combines with the chloride in the presence of the enzyme myeloperoxidase to form one of the most potent bactericidal agents within the phagolysosome which is called as hypochlorite. So, you can see here the oxygen dependent kindling uh, includes several oxygen radicals like ox superoxides, hydrogen peroxide, in addition hypochlorite which is formed by binding of hydrogen peroxide with the chloride. And three important enzymes that are involved in the process NADP oxidase, superoxide dismutase and myeloperoxidase. So, this is the same thing again which is shown in this uh, flow chart. You can see that there is increased oxygen intake within the phagolysosomes which is converted to superoxide 
with the help of the enzyme NADPH oxidase. Now, this superoxide that is formed, we learned that is converted to hydrogen peroxide and the enzyme that is involved in this catalytic action is superoxide dismutase. The hydrogen peroxide that is formed is converted to hypochlorous acid in the presence of myeloperoxidase and all these the superoxide, the hydrogen peroxide and the hypochlorite destroy the bacteria. And we learned that in this process, there is an increased consumption of oxygen within the phagolysosome, which is called as a respiratory burst. So, it is a very active phenomena, energy dependent phenomena that occurs within the leukocytes in the process of killing of these bacteria. So, we learned that there is an oxygen dependent killing and oxygen independent killing. So, we just learned about the oxygen dependent killing which involves hydrogen peroxide, superoxide and the hypochlorite. Now, let us look at the oxygen independent killing. Oxygen independent killing involves the various the toxic substances and enzymes which are present within the lysosomes which include lysozymes, defensins. Now, these defensins form pores on the bacterial cell wall causing increased water entry and cell bacteriolysis. Lactoferrin is another substance within the lysosome which is toxic and various other hydrolytic enzymes. So, there is a oxygen independent killing and a oxygen dependent killing. However, oxygen dependent is a very, very powerful bactericidal mechanism. So, apart from the reactive oxygen species that we just learnt, which is very important in killing of the bacteria, there are also reactive nitrogen species. Now, this nitrogen reactive nitrogen species are only formed in the leukocytes when they are activated. So, normally they are not present only when there is inflammation and the macrophages are activated are these reactive nitrogen species being formed. This is because in the response to inflammation there is an enzyme called as nitrous oxide synthase which is induced within the macrophages hence it is called as INOS. So, INOS is not normally present within the macrophages, they are induced in response to inflammation whereas, in certain other cells they are normally present for example, endothelial cells has ENOS, neuronal cells have ENOS whereas, INOS is induced only in the macrophages in response to inflammation. Now, what does this INOS do? It causes a catalytic action wherein oxygen is converted to nitrous oxide. Okay. So, you have the nitrous oxide in this process arginine is converted to citrulline and also NADPH is converted to NADP. So, oxygen instead of getting converted to superoxide in the reactive oxygen mechanism here is converted to nitrous oxide and this nitrous oxide is also a very potent microbicidal activity. In addition, the nitrous oxide that is formed binds with superoxides and results in formation of another potent antimicrobicidal agent which is called as peroxynitrates ONOO. So, this is also a potent microbicidal uh, substance. So, we learnt that in oxygen dependent killing now we have oxygen, um, the reactive oxygen species and the reactive nitrogen species. Reactive oxygen species we learnt superoxides, hydrogen peroxide and hypochlorite. Reactive nitrogen species we learnt nitrous oxide and peroxynitrates and the non oxygen dependent or oxygen independent mechanism we learnt about the various enzymes like the lysozymes, we learnt about lactoferrin, we learnt about hydrolytic enzymes and also we learnt about defensives. So, all these together are able to kill and degrade the bacterial uh, uh, bacteria or any injurious agents. So, it is the nitrous oxide and peroxynitrates which are the important reactive nitrogen species that are generated in case of inflammation. Remember, these are not normally formed in the macrophages. In response to inflammation, the enzyme that is uh, important in this formation that is INOS is generated by the macrophages when they are activated. So, the killing involves oxygen dependent and oxygen independent and uh, we just recollected the various uh, uh, substances or agents under these categories. Next coming to the topic of chemical mediators of inflammation. 
all these steps that are happening within the leukocytes, whether it's the margination or chemotaxis or phagocyte, all this happens because they are activated and stimulated by various substances that are produced at the site of inflammation. So, the chemical substances that are released at the site of inflammation which initiate or regulate the inflammatory response are called chemical mediators of inflammation. And there are various uh, chemical mediators that are involved. Important among these are the vasoactive amines, lipid products like prostaglandins and leukotrienes, cytokines and the components of the complement. So, there are several uh, hundreds of chemicals that are released at the site of inflammation, but the most important can be classified under one of these. So, let us learn about these a little more in detail. Coming to the uh, these mediators, they based on the source from where they are formed, you could classify them as cellular or they could be plasma derived. Cellular is as the name says, they are released by the cells which are at the site of inflammation, either the bacterial cell itself or the injured tissue or the immune cells or the inflammatory cells at the site of inflammation or they could be plasma derived which are formed in the liver and released into the plasma. Now, the cellular again they could be preformed, which means the cells could have this uh, present at all times within them, they are preformed or they are newly synthesized in response to the inflammation. So, cellular could be preformed or it could be newly synthesized. Some of the examples of preformed mediators are histamine, serotonin, lysosomal enzymes, they are always present within the cells. Newly formed examples are prostaglandins, leukotrienes, PAF or platelet activating factor, we just learnt oxygen species that is formed in response to inflammation nitrous oxide, cytokines etcetera which are generated or synthesized when there is a need. Coming to the plasma derived, we have the factor when there is an activation of factor 12 and the kinin system gets activated or the coagulation in the fibrinolytic system gets activated. These are also quite potent chemical mediators that play a role in inflammation. The complements again are very, very important substances that bring about various reactions that happen in case of inflammation. So, coming to vasoactive amines, as the name says, these are amines that have their action on vessels. So, they are vasoactive amines and the two most important substances that come under this category are the histamine and the serotonin. They have, as we learnt, the, the important action is on the blood vessels and these are some of the first mediators that are released in the process of inflammation. Now, histamine and serotonin, these are produced, the histamine is produced by mast cells, basophils and also platelets. So, histamine, the source of histamine is mast cells, basophils and the platelets while that of serotonin which is also called as 5 hydro tryptamine is the platelets. So, platelets produce serotonin as well as histamine. Now, they cause their action mostly on the blood vessels inducing we learn during the vascular events when we are learning about the vascular events of inflammation that mast cells at the site of inflammation release histamine within seconds or minutes of the in entry of an injurious agent resulting in vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability and it is responsible for the immediate effects that we see in case of inflammation is brought about by histamine. So, we learned that histamine causes increased gap between the vascular endothelial cells which is called as vaso increased vascular permeability and vasodilatation. This results in outflow of fluid from circulation to the tissues bringing about edema. So, the edema or swelling that you see at the site of inflammation within seconds or minutes of any injurious agent gaining entry into a body is brought about by histamine and serotonin. So, the mast cells are ready in our tissues to guard our body against any injurious agents. So, the moment it comes in contact with the injurious agent, the, the mast cells released the preformed uh, uh, substances that is histamine into the tissues. 
Okay, so we learned that this is they are preformed mediators. Histamines are preformed mediators that are present importantly within the mast cells, basophils, and platelets. So, in addition to having these preformed mediators within the mast cells, uh, that is histamine and heparin, mast cells also start synthesizing newly uh, formed mediators. So, they also start to produce mediators which include leukotrienes, prostaglandins, platelet activating factor, etc. So, in response to a bacterial infection or to other substances like complement components, they release the mediators which are present in a preformed uh, state that is the histamine and heparin. In addition, they start producing new mediators or synthesizing new mediators which include mostly leukotrienes and prostaglandins. So, just to revise what we learnt, histamine is derived from mast cells, basophils and platelets. It The effects on the blood vessels is because it binds to H1 receptors on the endothelial cells. And we learnt that the most important action of histamine is vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. Serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine is present within the platelets in a preformed state and the platelet starts releasing the serotonin when they are activated in case of inflammation. So, they are present within the dense granules of the platelets and the effects of serotonin are same as that of histamine. They bring about vasodilatation and increased vascular permeability. So, next we learn about some of the most important newly synthesized chemical mediators, uh, most importantly the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes. Both of them are derived from the membrane phospholipids. So, we can see here of various inflammatory cells whether it is neutrophils, macrophages or other cells. So, whenever there is inflammation apart from releasing the preformed mediators, these immune cells also start producing uh, new uh, chemical mediators to sustain the inflammation. Now, the membrane phospholipids are converted to arachidonic acid and this process is brought about by the action of the enzyme phospholipase. So, this arachidonic acid that is formed from phospholipids takes two pathways, actually three pathways, the third one being not that important. So, the arachidonic acid through two pathways that is cyclooxygenase pathway and the lipooxygenase pathway. Now, remember L for lipooxygenase, leukotrienes are formed from lipooxygenase pathway where a cyclooxygenase pathway gives rise to prostaglandins. Now, through the cyclooxygenase pathway, you have the generation of prostaglandin G2 which gets converted to prostaglandin H2 and then it gives rise to three further potent chemical mediators which are prostacycline or PGI2, thromboxane A2 or thrombo thromboxane A2. Uh, TXA2 and PGD2 and PGE2. So, this is the pathway for the cyclooxygenase uh, uh, route. Now, this prostacycline PGI2 and thromboxin A2 have uh, a very opposing effect on each other. While prostacycline causes vasodilatation and inhibits platelet aggregation, thromboxane leads to vasoconstriction and promotes platelet aggregation. So, they have an exactly opposite action to each other. Now, PGT2 and E2 result in vasodilatation and increase the vascular permeability. So, increased vascular permeability we learned so far histamine causes increased vascular permeability, serotonin causes vascular permeability. Now, we learned that prostaglandin most importantly D2 and E2 also cause increased vascular permeability. Now, through the lipooxygenase pathway, this is how the substances are generated. Uh, it gives rise to leukotriene A4, C4, D4 and E4. A4 gets converted to B4. Now, B4 you can see here is a very, very potent chemotactic factor. It attracts the leukocyte towards it. Once it starts producing leukotrienes, it starts getting more and more leukocytes to the site because it is chemotactic to leukocytes. So, leukotriene B4 is a very potent chemotactic factor. Leukotriene C4, D4 and E4 bring about bronchoconstriction and also increase vascular permeability. So, we learn here that PGT2 and E2 
and leukotriene C4, D4 and E4 result in increased vascular permeability while LTB4 causes chemotaxis. I just told you there is a third less important pathway which is through the 12 lipooxygenase pathway where it generates lipoxins. Now, lipoxins uh, when compared to cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase pathway which generate factors which stimulate inflammation, lipoxin has an inhibitory effect on inflammation through generation of lipoxin A4 and B4. So, lipoxin pathway inhibits inflammation and keeps a check on the inflammation while cyclooxygenase and the lipooxygenase pathway cause or induce stimulate inflammation. So, just to summarize uh, the effects of arachidonic acid metabolites which are also called as eicosanoids. We learnt that vasodilatation, the factors that are involved are PGI2, D2 and E2. Vasoconstriction is thromboxane A2. Increased vascular permeability is PGD2, E2 and leukotriene C4, D4 and E4 and chemotaxis is leukotriene B4. So, this is the other way of looking at it. What are the effects that prostaglandins produce? It causes vasodilatation, the PGE2 causes vasodilatation. In addition, the pain and fever that you get when you have an inflammation, for example, acute tonsillitis or acute uh, sinusitis, the pain that you get at the site of inflammation or the fever that you get is caused by prostaglandins. PGI2 causes vasodilatation, thromboxin a2, I told you, has an opposing effect to prostaglandin I2, which causes vasoconstriction. Leukotrienes, we learnt LTB4 is an important chemotactic factor and C4, D4 and E4 cause increased vascular permeability and vasoconstriction. We learnt that lipoxin has an inhibitory effect on inflammation. Now, why is it important to know these factors that are involved in inflammation? Now, the fact that we know that these are involved in inflammation, you could target these to have an anti-inflammatory effect. So, the steroids that are used while treating some of the chronic inflammatory conditions inhibit the membrane phospholipase, thereby reducing the production of both leukotrienes and prostaglandins. The aspirin that is commonly used to treat inflammation is has an inhibitory effect on the prostaglandins thereby has an anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, next coming to uh, a group of uh, chemical mediators that are again very important in inflammation are cytokines and chemokines. Now, cytokines are proteins that are present produced by various cells like the lymphocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells and they are very important in the inflammatory cell response. So, cytokines as the name says they are produced by cells and they have a very important role in inflammatory response. There are a there is a long list of cytokines, but the most important among the cytokines are the TNF or the tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 1 and interleukin 6. These are the major ones. Now, as we learned, the source of cytokines could be lymphocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells while to some extent it is also produced by endothelial cells, the connective tissue cells and the epithelial cells. And what causes release of cytokines by these cells? It is the microbial products itself or when you have an injury, tissue injury releasing certain substances or a foreign body, these act as a stimulus causing these various cells to release cytokines. And also the, the binding of the bacteria, the microbes to the receptors on the cells, which are the toll-like receptors. I am sure you have learnt about toll-like receptors in uh, the chapter on immunity. These toll-like receptors bind to the microbial products and form a complex what is called as an inflammasome. Now, this causes release of cytokines by the cells. Now, the various types of cytokines that are produced are interleukins, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, list goes on and tumor necrosis factor among which as I already told you interleukin 1 and TNF are the most important. So, let us see what are the effects of interleukin 1 and tumor necrosis factor. They have various functions and the most important functions they act 
they are produced by leukocytes and they have their effect on other leukocytes and also on endothelial cells. So, what are the effects on leukocytes? On the leukocytes, it increases the microbial activity of the leukocytes, also increased generation of the nitrous oxide which learnt is a potent anti antimicrobial agent. So, the cytokines act on leukocytes producing more NO or nitric oxide. They act on the endothelial cells to increase the expression of various addition molecules. We learned that these addition molecules were important in emigration of leukocytes to the tissue. So, it activates the endothelial cells to express these endothelial cell molecules and also causes increased formation of eicosanoids. We learned prostaglandins and leukotrienes. So, they cause increased production of these on the endothelial cells, expression of growth factors, etcetera. So, they have varied effects on various cells thereby uh, potentiating the effects in inflammation. In addition, it is responsible for what is called as the acute phase reaction which we are learn, going to learn in the subsequent uh, class. Acute phase reaction are certain symptoms uh, which are uh, which occur in response to infection for example, fever uh, and also uh, other effects like we see leukocytosis in the blood vessels, we see increased ESR. These are some of the acute phase reactions that you see in inflammation and cytokines are responsible for this acute phase reaction. So, you can see here we learnt that interleukin 1 and TNF act on the blood vessels cause increased expression of addition molecules and also they act on the other cells as well causing increased microbicidal activity. So, we it has effects on leukocytes, it acts, has effects on blood vessels thereby uh, generating a good inflammatory response. At the same time, we learned that there is acute systemic reaction. How does this bring about this acute systemic reaction? Fever that occurs in case of inflammation is an effect of these cytokines on the brain, on the center which regulates the temperature. So, TNF, interleukin 1 and interleukin 6 act on these centers in the brain causing fever. It also acts on the liver to produce increased production of proteins which is responsible for increased ESR that you get in patients with inflammation. Also, I am sure you have learnt about the C-reactive protein which is a sign of inflammation which is also induced by the action of cytokines on the liver. Also, these have effects on the bone marrow. So, the bone marrow starts producing more and more leukocytes which are released into circulation leading to leukocytosis. All these are protective mechanism to help our body fight against the infection. But if these cytokines are produced in massive amounts, for example, in a patient with septicemia, this can have a deleterious effects on the body. It can suppress the heart resulting in low cardiac output. It can cause widespread endothelial activation, thrombus formation and what is called as DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. It can also act on the skeletal muscles really resulting in insulin resistance because of which there is hyperglycemia. These are all the adverse or deleterious effects that you see in infection because of massive release of cytokines occurring in patients with septicemia. So, in today's class we learnt about the mechanism of phagocytosis and killing by oxygen dependent and oxygen independent mechanisms. We also learnt about the various chemical mediators which were classified into four important groups, vasoactive amines, the um, arachidonic acid metabolites, cytokines and chemokines and various other chemical mediators uh, which help in the process of inflammation. Thank you.